Nowadays we call it World War I or the First World War. At the time it was simply the war. And by the time it was over, the Great War. Whatever we call it, this was the first time war had been waged on a global scale. And although many troops were still on horseback and on foot, it was the first time modern weaponry such as armoured tanks and aeroplanes were used in battle. It was also the first time illustrated propaganda was widely used as a strategic psychological weapon by all the major powers involved in the conflict. The rapid growth and success of advertising across Europe and America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries had demonstrated how effectively illustration could be used to manipulate the masses. And it didn't take a particularly big leap of the imagination to apply a similar psychological approach to warfare. When the war began in 1914, thousands of men across Britain volunteered for a fight they thought would be over by Christmas. At the outset there was no conscription, so propaganda posters were used relentlessly to persuade, cajole and bully those who weren't quite so keen to fight. Alfred Leet's graphically drab but psychologically effective image of Lord Kitchener's stern face and accusatory finger was plastered on every available wall and impossible to avoid. And there were others applying similar pressure, leaving men with little choice but to fight or face eternal condemnation. This rather stiffly painted poster by Savile Lumley used the innocence of children and the stigma of cowardice to make its none too subtle point. And it wasn't just posters applying pressure. This comic postcard was just one of a series which portrayed conscientious objectors as effeminate homosexuals. But usually it was a more benign humour which was employed to boost the morale of the men at the front and the loved ones they had left behind. The watercolour comic postcards of Douglas Tempest generally depicted the amiable fortitude of the British foot soldier and simultaneously poked surprisingly light-hearted fun at his rather dim-witted German opponent. These cards were sent back and forth from the battlefields of Europe as if the troops were on holiday rather than being bombed, shot at and gassed in muddy trenches. And the equally stoical cartoons of Bruce Bairn's father appeared every week in the magazine The Bystander. Bairn's father himself had fought and been badly injured in battle, but despite his own wartime experiences, he nevertheless chose to amuse the civilian population with a totally sanitised comical impression of life on the front line. And so did the preposterous and ingenious weaponry illustrations of William Heath Robinson. These were published not only in magazines, but also ran to several volumes of popular humorous books as the relentless slaughter continued. One of the most popular pieces of comic propaganda was the Berlin Tapestry, a satirical pastiche of the Bayer Tapestry by John Hassel, published in 1915. This fold-out sequence told the tale of Germany preparing for war, how they had caused the war in the first place, and how we and the French were going to stop them. As Britain's leading satirical magazine, Punch, of course, featured many wartime cartoons from its contributors. Most notable of these was Bernard Partridge, who used his flawless intricate pen drawings to mock the Germans, and the Kaiser in particular, with barbed satirical humour. But comic illustration was generally seen as inappropriate for the more serious messages conveyed by the posters, and consequently most of them featured more representational styles. And while many continued to recruit yet more young men to what was proving to be a considerably longer than expected war, others urged the women at home to do all they could to contribute, mostly by doing the jobs left vacant by their husbands and sons. Most of these posters were not only blunt in their message, but were generally undistinguished in technical and aesthetic terms. There was, however, one illustrator in Britain whose work was both technically flawless and an honest visual record. 
Italian-born Fortunino Mitania had become a British citizen some years earlier and was now the official war artist for the Sphere magazine. His spectacularly realistic evocations of the war were undoubtedly propaganda in that they told a rather one-sided story of British bravery and victories, but they didn't gloss over the bloodshed and misery of the trenches. In this war our enemies were collectively known as the Central Powers and consisted of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria and Turkey, then known as the Ottoman Empire. The Germans were by far the most prolific propagandists and they used the power of illustrated posters to depict themselves as righteous crusaders against the forces of evil. Consequently, much of their imagery not only used historical patriotic symbolism, but was frequently created to emulate the Germanic traditional woodblock technique, complete with Gothic typefaces. And whatever their levels of success in strengthening German resolve, they were like most of the Allied propaganda pretty much uniform in their lack of visual subtlety. But Germany's greatest asset in the propaganda war was undoubtedly Ludwig Holwein, now generally acknowledged to be one of the greatest graphic illustrators of the age. The visual power and emotional intensity of his posters was far more sophisticated than anything else produced during the conflict. And although he too used his talents to sanctify the heroic nature of the German soldier, he did it with a remarkably advanced sense of design and an eye for aesthetic balance. Away from the direct assault of their poster campaigns, the Germans too created plenty of cartoons. Up to 1914, the magazine Simplicissimus had been notoriously anti-establishment, but once the war began, the publication devoted itself to expressions of patriotism and solidarity with the German war effort, using some of the best illustrators and cartoonists around at the time, including Thomas Hein and Norwegian-born Olaf Gulbranson. And they weren't the only ones. Among others, the humour magazine Lustiger Blatter featured the remarkably modern absurdist doodles of Walter Trier to raise a laugh at the enemy's expense. Of the other central powers, only the Austro-Hungarian Empire made any significant contribution to the propaganda war. Most of it was graphically unremarkable and emulated the bulk of the German posters, both stylistically and thematically, with yet more rousing medievalist imagery. They too fared much better as cartoonists, with the magazine Die Musket which devoted its wartime pages to the cause with stylish and individualistic contributions from Austrian talents such as Franz Vejcik. Of the Allied forces, the French and Belgians were very much at the sharp end of the conflict. Most of the fighting was, after all, taking place on their land. Consequently, much of their propaganda was particularly vitriolic in its portrayal of the Germans as brutal barbarian invaders. And when they weren't expressing their hatred of all things German, they portrayed themselves as valiant victims or David against Germany's Goliath and with justification. Most of their posters tended towards the stylistically traditional and they generally confined themselves to competent but uninspired representational figure work in support of the patriotic messages. Once again, it was the cartoonists who made the most telling contribution. Luria magazine had changed its name to Luria Rouge during the war, and they boasted any number of talented comic illustrators who enthusiastically made fun of their enemies, usually personified in merciless depictions of the Kaiser himself. Charles Leandre was perhaps the most prominent among their artists and his energetic and stylistically complex colour work attacked all things Germanic with particular vitriol and visual imagination. Leandre also contributed to the covers and pages of the wartime magazine La Bayonnette alongside many others including the deceptively casual drawn humour of the immensely popular and influential modernist Gus Bofa. Italy fought with the Allies and, like the French, their poster work favoured melodramatic representational painted images. 
technically the quality of the painting varied wildly, and although there were a few which displayed greater than usual skill, the Italians had undoubtedly lost their greatest illustrative asset when Fortunino Mattagna had emigrated to Britain. But what they did have was the grotesque graphic imagery of surrealist artist and illustrator Alberto Martini, one of the few willing to deal with the horrific realities of the war without compromise. He created a series of disturbing postcards, collectively known as La Danza Macabra, which were distributed across Europe. And in this sequence of visceral images, Martini was particularly critical of the role of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the conflict. Like the other Allies, Russia created propaganda posters in support of their war effort, but most of it was once again fairly functional and of only passing visual interest. And in 1917 they withdrew from the war to concentrate on the more pressing matter of the Russian Revolution and the Civil War which followed. Luckily their departure wasn't felt too keenly as that was the same year the Americans, who had been neutral up to that point, were finally persuaded to throw their weight behind the Allied forces. And in addition to providing much needed manpower and weaponry, America also boasted the talents of some of their most prominent illustrators. Among them was the immensely popular James Montgomery Flagg, who reinvented the austere British Kitchener recruitment poster, now featuring the mythical figure of Uncle Sam, posed by Flagg himself. This became a successful mini-campaign and Flagg went on to paint several variations on a theme. The equally celebrated Leyendecker brothers, Joseph and Frank, also made contributions, with some stirring, patriotic, if manifestly homoerotic, recruitment posters encouraging young men to join the various armed forces. Their depictions of the male figure may have been rather romanticised, but they were nevertheless graphically dynamic and of course technically flawless. Wildlife artist Charles Livingston Bull was yet another of America's upper echelon of illustrators to contribute, and he produced several striking, dramatically graphic posters in support of the American troops. Not all American propaganda was of the same high quality, and they too had their share of more functional imagery, but it was a clear indication of how visually sophisticated American illustration had become in a very short time. The added muscle of America undoubtedly helped bring the war to an end, and in 1918 Germany and the other Central Powers finally surrendered. When the smoke had cleared it was estimated that around 17 million people had died. And across Europe everyone set about the rebuilding of their ravaged towns and cities in a period of uneasy peace. When the fighting was over, American President Woodrow Wilson coined yet another name for this conflict. He called it the war to end all wars. Sadly, he couldn't have been more wrong. And that'll be the subject of the second part of this series.